Hello everyone. Okay, so I get asked quite a bit um, by some people, what do I do when I start the game? And I guess, as a developer, sometimes you get those dev goggles on, you don't realise just how confusing things might be. And I can understand there's actually quite a lot of stuff to sort of take in when you first start the game. So, I'm going to do something called a dev tutorial. Um, I'm just going to show you exactly how I play the game personally. Obviously, this might not align with how you want to play, and there's many other ways that you can play. And sometimes there are certain play styles that can do things that I don't really consider ways of gaming the system and stuff that I don't really think of. So, you know, there's many ways to play. But I'm going to start a brand new game and I'm going to go for a let's go random races. We'll leave it up to fate, no time limit. And it's just, you know, random everything. Uh, default kingdom. I'm going to go for normal mode, standard start. Let's just let the world generate. And yeah, so I'm going to show you what I would usually do in the first year. Now this will totally vary based on what random kingdoms we get because obviously, you know, maybe I want to do a bit of diplomacy, but if none of them are able to be diplomatic, then, you know, ignore that whole process. Um, so we've got yellow sunlight scions, so they might be civil. Brutish satyrs, mm, probably not. Youthful tideland zombies, I very much doubt we'll get anything out of them. Confused harpies, probably not. And tideland pyromancers, yeah. So it's an interesting mix. I'm going to skip my introductory ceremony. I mean, if you're new to the game, obviously you're going to want to check that out. Um, and so I've got 2,000 gold and 705 men. Generally speaking, you want to put your gold to work, uh, and that's just saving up for something specifically. Um, I would say first thing I would do, I guess, is see the whoever's waiting to see me in the throne room. So we've got 25 people waiting to see me. Um, people in the throne room are the people of your kingdom, um, maybe some visiting foreigners, whatever. And they can help you. Um, so I can actually specify what I do and don't want to see, but I'm just going to go along with it. So, okay, I don't really want to hear a joke. Um, I don't want to... I'm going to give him nothing. Um, Alright, I'll set the rules. Let's say I don't want to deal with any criminal cases. I don't want beggars. I don't want jesters. I don't want entertainers. Um, I don't want complaints. And I don't want bards. I just... So there's going to be a few less people. So instead of 25, um, there's 11 now. But these people are going to be more suited to what I'm specifically asking for. So this guy wants to join my army. Bam. We've got an extra soldier. This guy wants to go on a quest. Go ahead. Um, this guy wants to be enlisted, but 25 gold. Uh, fuck off. Um, Alright, who else we got? Ooh, this guy wants to bet with me. I thought I disabled that, but I am going to force you to give me all your gold. So, it's a bit naughty, but I mean, who cares? And I now have extra gold. Um, so, generally speaking, a couple of maybe slightly cheeky moves at the start of the game, if that's not breaking who you are as a character, um, can help you. Yep, go on a quest. Um, go on a quest. Yep, okay, plus one peasant. Um, ooh. Bron the Brain Damaged wants to be a knight. I don't have that kind of money. Go away. You can't simply request to be a knight. Yeah, thank you for your time as well. Alright, go on a quest. And um, a man from the slums. Yeah, join me. Okay, enthusiasm. So the throne room's done. So we've got 2,170 gold. Um, now mercenaries, if I had a lot of gold, it might be something to consider. I should probably check the diplomatic situation. So I'm going to drop into the arranged diplomacy screen. And we can see the rebels, the bandit horde, and so on. Um, now the main things we're going to be looking into are going to be the independent kingdoms. Um, so we can see three of them are already at war with us. Two of them don't mind us. So um, the sunlight scions. Now I can see there's only 63 of them. They're actually quite weak, really. Um, and I guess Manak Doomhand um, doesn't like me. But maybe I can ask them to... Um, okay, so I, they're my vassal now. So I basically said to them, I have 700 how many troops you have 63 this will go bad for you and they agree so now they're my vassal now they're going to send me some money every turn i can request them to stop fighting anyone um and i can ask them to give me more money i can ask them to give me more troops every turn um and we should be able to trade yep okay so that's good um now we got the civil free state so they they don't mind us um they could still attack us we don't know uh, but generally speaking, yeah, they seem okay. Um, I guess we'll just leave that as it is. Maybe we should make a trade agreement. Good, okay. Um, the Baradu. Ah, so these Tideland zombies. Um, oh, youthful Tideland zombies. So they got baby heads. Very interesting. Hi, Muckamuck Calden of the Pirate Shore. <laughs> very weird name. Um, okay, well, yeah, these guys are not going to be very friendly with us. They have seven lands. A couple of that. Well, a couple of hundred men, I guess. Um, Marked state, confused harpies. Oh, they're actually decent. Okay. They don't want to trade with us, though. You need to gain his trust, which means you need to give him some money. 
Um, okay, so well, at least they're not attacking us. I've got the Thailand Pyromancers. Oh, I'm rejecting that peace deal. And they don't like us a lot more now. Well, I messed that one up a little bit, but what are you going to do? Got a Goblin Slaver. Um, so he has a total of 197 Goblins. Uh, now, the Goblin Slaver is an additional character in the game that alternates every game. Um, so you might wish to ban him straight away and gain the favour of the goblins in your kingdom or you might want to keep him because he gives you troops and a little income source from the tax he pays on selling those goblins. However, how he functions varies depending on his ability. So we speak to him. What makes you different? So he pays me twice the tribute. Um, huh. Okay, so, so he'll pay us a little extra money, which is a good bonus um, that you may never see again in a game. Um, I don't know if that makes his goblins more expensive though, but 197 goblins. Mm, I mean, how many? 10 goblins is 60 gold. I mean, that's still quite good. The goblins fight about the same as peasants do in battle. Um, and if you have too many goblins, people will be upset. But if I buy 100 goblins for 600 gold, um, you know, my army is now being boosted. Um, but actually, peasants are quite cheap as well. So I'm going to buy all the remaining peasants. Um, peasants work the field, make you money and stuff. Uh, bandits will steal money from your enemies. I guess we can hire a couple of those. Um, and yeah, so we we're not going to be doing anything with mercenaries this turn. No chance. Um, now what you might want to do is get some new staff. Um, so I guess we'll do that. So Old Kroll is terrible. He's your default diplomat, but he's actually pretty weak. You can't speak to certain groups, things like that. So we're going to fire him. And we're going to hopefully get a good roll of random potential replacements. So we've got a goblin, a noble, and another guy. This guy's called Kroll. <laughs> he's like Kroll the Younger or something. But he's got a better skill level. Um, so we can see that they're all quite expensive. Old Kroll took 50 gold per turn, and each of these is more expensive. Although, you know, the first two marginally so. But Subuk the Goblin, or I don't know how you'd say that actually. Um, he is quite expensive, but he's also very, very talented. And Green Snout the Goblin is a bit of a liar because um, he's taken extra gold, but he's, he's only worth 65 um, skill. It's not that much better than Old Crow. So we're going to go for Skuzubk. I don't know how you say that. Um, so blah, 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 blah. I had references, but I know great my parchment. Nice. Um, so this will give us a special bonus as well. The fact that this guy is a goblin, which is really lucky that we got two goblins in this loadout, really. Because if you get a goblin, it allows you to gain additional diplomatic bonuses with the goblin kingdoms. And it also allows you to be diplomatic with them in, in the first place, because you ordinarily can't speak to them unless you train a human to speak goblin, which is a, an additional loop to jump through. So we're going to go through with this guy. So, um, so now we're going to be able to speak to extra factions. We may uh, be able to speak to the goblin kingdoms now. So, yep, we can make peace for menial amounts of gold. And we're cool. And now we can view their totem. We can, you know, speak to them. Um, and then we've got the goblin kingdom of Eric, the same, but and it's a lot more money for them. Screw them. Um, we sort it out later on. Um, and then we've got... Um, so Gorin Pikener is quite good, actually, um, as your default uh, general. It's got 100 skills. It's decent. Um, so we've got spy masters. Um, so we've got Ianar the Crusader, Ieli the, of the Cloak, and Elgrim Havocbringer. And we can see that the... Oh, well, Ieli and Elgrim have almost identical skill level, um, but the most, the slightly more skilled guy is slightly cheaper. And Ianar the Crusader is more expensive than them all, but he's also very skilled, so we'll go with him. Um, and obviously we've paid the initial year's fee, so we're running low on gold at the moment. Um, now, some people tend to go to the arena. Um, the arena isn't accepting bets, apparently. Hang on. Prohibited betting, you mean? As he breathes, it should be purely for entertainment. Wow. Okay. Well, that is something I forgot existed in the game. Um, so, the arena varies. Um, so, you can bet in the arena, make some money. Um, the arena also gets a random leader. Um, and this random leader prohibits betting and gambling, which completely changes the ability of this thing. Uh, wow, that's interesting. Okay. Well, so sometimes players will bet in the arena, but in this case, if this was your save, you wouldn't be able to bet in the arena at all. Um, now, you might want to check the Royal Bank. There's a random amount of gold in there at the start of uh, any game. And that is actually a helpful amount of gold, because it brings us back to where we were before. Um, so, you might want to change the laws of the land. Um, oh, those are upgrades. Did the wrong one. There we go. So... Generally speaking, you want to make sure that all the taxes are on if you need money, uh, aside from tax tax, because that's going to really piss people off. But banking tax, for example, 
Um, you may not want to put that if you have a significant amount of um, gold in the bank because it will stifle your interest rates and make you earn less. But generally speaking, it's going to be better to have the banking tax on than not, although you will get a little bit of a public opinion knock for doing that. Um, for recruitment and training, it's generally better to have um, forceful enlistment, in my opinion. Um, soldiers um, are twice as strong as peasants, um, but if you have forceful enlistment, you get twice as many peasants as you do soldiers. But peasants will actually earn you money, where soldiers will cost you um, that money in wages. So generally speaking, it's better to have a productive and larger population, which is why forceful enlistment is what I usually go for. Um, Declaring no enlistment, I don't know why you would do that, but perhaps you would like to keep your army at a specific size. The options are there, and that will just mean you won't get anyone. Um, banning local militia, this will mean that you'll gain more peasants every year um, as direct enlistment, but you won't have the ability to hire any additional peasants from the militia, nor you have the militia helping you. The militia is a helpful faction, so banning them is done, in my opinion. But again, the option is there. And the option to cease peasant training, I use this on occasion. So every year, um, depending on building upgrades and how many knights you have and so on, your peasants can be converted into soldiers, trained up, which is good. You know, you're turning them from, you know, lower level troops into combat ready units that can fight for you and stuff. However, um, you may want to keep your army productive. Maybe you've got a massive amount of peasants and a massive amount of soldiers and slowly turning those massive amounts of peasants into soldiers eventually will leave you with no additional peasants and no one to pay for the army. So you might want to stop that. Um, I don't mind either way. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go for forceful enlistment. And public opinion slightly off on that one because people don't like that. But what are they going to do? Goblin policies, generally speaking, who cares? Um, but if you ban goblin slavery and begin a goblin celebration, you'll be invited to a special event um, if you discover the town of Goblinwood, which is cool. Mercenary policies, generally speaking, you don't really need to bother with these unless you want to attack the mercenary groups. Social policies, too expensive usually. Um, however, you can free any slaves you have here if you've got the option to. Um, and then prison stuff, again, to be honest, it's reasonable how it, it's left by default, but these allow different things um, to get more prisoners or to help the prisoners and so on. Um, celebrations, if I want to declare an event. Um, and we've got other things, can rename the kingdom, different year, force hats and so on. But most of those things aren't relevant. So, um, and we've got Kingdom Upgrade, so I've got a little bit of gold. So I might be able to do a few tiny things, but to be honest... Um, yeah, there's not really a lot you can do. Um, so, some of these... So the recruitment signs will give more recruits every turn, so slightly additional men. I don't know. Might be worth it, maybe I'll go for that. Oh, I clicked the wrong one, I clicked number one. Um, number six. There we go, so up to two extra peasants recruited per land owned each year. Um, but slightly less joiners will visit me in the throne, naturally. Um, and have I got enough money for anything else? So, nobility post. 1 in 20 chance of um, recruiting a knight each turn. Or goblin hut, 150, 1 in 3 chance of a goblin joining me. So, these things can lure units towards your kingdom, but I mean, a 1 turn is 1 year. So, you know, I'm... It's it's a very small bonus, but you can grow it and develop it into something that really can help you. Um, so if I go for the, the goblin thing, yeah, the next upgrade is a lot more, but it guarantees goblins. But eh, at least I got some chance of getting them. Uh, and then tribute collections, but I'm not tributing anyone at the moment. Goblin slave a personal guard to ensure they don't get assassinated. Throne room signs, more people. Yeah, whatever. And um, generally speaking, it's better at the end of your turn to store your money in the bank um, if you're worried about getting raided. So certain minor bandit factions, for example, if you're not truced with them, like the Deathmar Gatekeepers or the Far Western Guard in the case of this game, or the major bandit horde is non-existent in this game, luckily. Um, they can attack you, they can steal your gold. Also any raiding foreign races, they can steal your gold and leave you unable to even pay your wages, which can lead again to deserters and mutiny, which just it you know multiplies your problems so yeah it's, it's there's a lot of stuff to consider um, and finally I would say probably one of the more important things really is exploration so I usually push north by default but you can go into any any direction really in general um, and you get three explore chances so I just use one of them to find Fort Kulak I'm gonna use one here and I discover a black orb on the ground um, and another one 
Um, you see an envoy of a foreign king whose banner you do not recognize. You approach and explain that you two are a king of this land and ask him his business. He claims that he's passing through the realm in search of noble knights to fight for his cause. You will hire a single one of your knights if you just open it. So he's willing to pay huge amounts of money for a knight. So lucky me. 1,500 men. And just to clarify how much that is, let's have a look. To hire a knight, it would cost me 576 gold at the current price. So he paid not, just under three times the market value of a knight. And if I were to sell a knight here, I would only make 288 gold. So it's a real big deal. It's a nice bonus. And with that extra money, I think maybe I'll buy some goblins. Maybe I'll buy all of the remaining goblins. And um, boom, look at that. We've hit exactly 1,000 men. So um, I've taken my army from a small number. I've done a couple of things. Oops. Um, I'm going to go to the th uh, Royal Bank and deposit the remaining gold. So that's what I've got ready for next turn. So we've dealt with the throne room. We've checked our staff and hired a bunch of new ones. We've um, arranged some diplomacy. We've ended up with a vassal, made peace, done some trade deals. We've altered our laws, built a good army, so on and so forth. And we've learned about the world. Um, and as you're exploring, you're going to discover more and more locations that will and won't be relevant to you, that you can conquer and interact with. Um, Kingdom reports will show you all the interesting things that have been happening um, in the game. You can also view your current troop count and how strong they are. Um, you can uh, free slaves. You can replace this, the symbol of your kingdom with, I don't know, the plus symbol if you want. Um, you can view the rankings of the factions in the game and see who's, you know, got the biggest armies and so on. And didn't realize, but it actually looks like the rebels are pretty tough in this game by default. So fun times ahead for whoever's playing this game. Um, you can see how many knights are questing and so on. And then... I've got other buildings, so any locations I've got, I can visit them and have a look. Um, and there's some that you can unlock over time. You've got the Royal Bank, which you can withdraw, deposit, take loans, and so on. You can actually raid the bank as well, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, then we've got the Arena, which is for entertainment and gambling, although in this case, just entertainment. Um, but I can buy it and take over the Arena, but you need a lot of money. Um, then we've got the Throne Room, where you can primarily deal with your, you know, people of your kingdom. But that's not just... Um, that's not the, the only thing you can do. You can also call meetings of the council and ask them various questions to help you with, you know, the game. And learn about managing the realm, set rules, so on and so forth. Um, then we've got kingdom upgrades. So there's plenty of things to upgrade there that will help you in every aspect. Um, there's loads of laws you can change. There's diplomacy where you can discuss and learn of all the factions in the world. And it's recommended at every game that you at least visit the independent territories and have a look at who's in the world because these are some of the main groups. And there's lots you can do with them. You know, you can see their leader, visit their unique locations, using their architectural style and whatever, trade with them, make alliances and whatever. Um, and then we've got, you know, staff and things. Um, champions are something we didn't actually really look into too much, uh, but you'll pull from a list of champions. Um, I can actually anoint one of my own knights as a champion, which is free, which is something I probably should have mentioned. Um, you only get one chance to do this per turn, so I'm going to do this now, actually. So as long as you've got one knight in your army, um, you can basically jump one up to be an actual champion of your kingdom. And they're going to be stronger than the average unit, so, you know, it's pretty good. So we've got a loyal knight here, and he's wearing the official helmet of my kingdom. Uh, so I have the option to arrange a trial, or to have no trial. If I have no trial, then um, there may be a public opinion loss, because it's not traditional to have no trial. Um, but also... Um, having a trial can gain me and him certain things depending on what I choose. So I'm going to actually order a trial. Um, so there are three options I can go for. I can have this uh, knight prove himself by climbing to the top of the highest mountain in the region um, to retrieve a stone from the top. And if I do that, I'll gain public opinion as it's quite a traditional trial. Um, I can have him find me an artifact and he will pull a completely random artifact, theoretically if he survives, from the world. Um, gaining me a random amount of gold, which could be 10 gold, it could be tens of thousands of gold if I'm really, really, really lucky. And then the third option is to have him fight against a random warrior, and if he wins, then he will gain strength. So really, there's a lot of options in how you deal with this. If I require some public opinion, maybe I want to send him off to get a stone. If I'm strapped for gold, maybe I, I send him off to go find me an artifact. And if I really want him to be a strong champion, I can have him prove his strength to begin with. But obviously, there's a big chance they can fail any of these things, and if they do, they die. So you lose a knight in the process and have to try and 
a year in the future. So I'm actually have him send um, go and find some gold or some artifact for me. Um, so he's he's getting ready. Now after I press enter, it's going to tell me whether he's successful or not. So fingers crossed. And no, okay. So your knight does not return from the quest for an artifact. The position of champion stays vacant, and the knight is assumed dead. Well, that is not good. So yeah. So there's lots of stuff you can do. Um, I'm trying to think what else did I miss out here. Um, I think I'm pretty much covered it all. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, obviously this is just the first turn. Um, ooh, you can see the 999 men now. Rest in peace to that one knight. Um, but yeah, the game will vary. So some of what I've shown will not apply. Um, for example, the arena might work in your game. Um, exploration can go completely differently. The staff you have will vary. The kingdoms can be all savage or maybe they'll all, all be very friendly to you from the get-go. Um, I actually noticed something that's going to become a problem for me in this game, and that's the one of these factions where are they um, the confused harpies. So one of the um, traits of confused races, so confused harpies, confused dwarves, anything like that, is that they will constantly randomize their relations with everyone. So they're gonna they they get confused about who's their enemy, who's their friend. So right now they like me, but next turn they may attack me. Next turn they may hate me more than anyone, and they're going to attack my lands. And the turn afterwards, maybe they're fine again. Maybe they're neutral. Maybe they love me, you know. And I can make trade agreements with them. But next turn, they'll break those trade agreements and declare war on me, maybe, you know. So it's uh, this is something that some players may never see in the game. Um, but, well, I don't think anyone's probably going to see confused harpies, but certainly not even the confused prefix. It's still very rare to even see that alone. And so obviously, it's quite hard to give a a really personal tutorial to. Um, war sim because things do vary um, play by play but generally speaking I, I hope you've got the gist of what you need to do um, for anyone who's confused or or looking for a better delve into how you play the game and yeah that's pretty much it that is a dev tutorial of what I would do in my first year in war sim in depth so thanks for watching guys if you've got any questions at all um, anything you'd like to see let me know and um, I'll happily respond to you Thanks for watching. Catch you next time.